For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and socially. In the midst of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other than human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationship to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. This podcast is produced and made possible from supporters on Patreon. Thank you. If the Rewilding Podcast inspires you, gives you hope, or makes you think, please subscribe, share it on social media, and become a patron at patreon.com slash Bauer. If you're new to rewilding or want to expand your perception of it, I recommend attending one of my Rewilding 101 workshops, which I offer both in person in Portland, Oregon, and online via Zoom for those who live around the world. You can check out upcoming dates and register at rewildportland.com. Rewilding looks different in places all around the world, but also shares many similarities, from settler colonialism to mainstream co-option. In this episode, we'll be looking at rewilding in Eastern Australia, my guest is Eva Angafra, founder of Wild Beings. Barefoot wanderer Eva has spent the most of the last five years outside, living in various wild locations, learning and practicing wild living skills such as friction fire, natural tanning, leather work, animal processing, using the whole animal, weaving, natural rope making, wild foods foraging, and bird identification. Passionate about sharing a more connected, wholesome culture and providing spaces where people can connect with the old ways and incorporate more of these skills and practices into their lifestyle choices that lead to connection and a more empowered way of self-sufficiency. Eva is a bushcraft educator working in schools and a facilitator of ancestral skills gatherings, rewilding workshops, wilderness immersions, and women's rewilding gatherings through wild beings, co-facilitating alongside Wildcraft Australia for their seasonal family village camps. Thank you, Eva, for coming on to the Rewilding Podcast. G'day, Peter. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So we met in the Rewilding 101 class. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm super curious to kind of have a, a more broad perspective on your rewilding journey. So um, I just wanted to ask, you know, what is rewilding to you and where did um, where did you come to it? Mm. I love this question because there's so many different answers to it and it depends what what season in my life um, mm. depicts the answer. But really right now, rewilding to me is it's based around connecting to our hunter-gatherer um, ancestry and really the mentalities and the belief systems and the practices that come with that. And when I think about rewilding, I think about building relationships and understanding our relationship in the context of our local ecology. And But I'm learning more and more that it really is about a kind of <laughs> in, internal rewilding mm. because everything comes from inside mm. and is mirrored outside. So, yeah, the last few years after learning the skills and, and living that lifestyle of rewilding, I've realised that it kind of, yeah, comes from an internal place of understanding that we are a part of this vast ecology, that we aren't just this separate human living in this <laughs> domesticated world. And, yeah, that's been a really beautiful journey to um, for the lifestyle to lead me into that internal rewilding journey. So basically, I mean, were you inspired by bushcraft initially or was there like you know, what was what was the catalyst? Mm. So it's a little bit of an interesting story. So I I left my hometown of the Central Coast in 2017 with my best friend and we just kind of got in the car and we're like, let's just go for a while. Let's just go around Australia. I want to meet the rest of this country. And, yeah, along that trip I really was – separated from the rest of the world we were really living on the edges of society and we were um, meeting a lot of interesting people who were living close to the land some not living close to the land but still really really mm -hmm. yeah separated from that mainstream world 
And I just realized, oh my goodness, like there is, what are we doing? <laughs> Working nine to five every day and feeling like I have to wear makeup and dress a certain way as a woman and all of that jazz. I feel like I was just kind of burst open um, into, into what the potential of what living could look mm. like. And, you know, we had no plans and that was a really incredible flow to be in to just be really traveling and wandering up the east coast of Australia and into some wild places and you know I remember not pulling out my identification card my ID for like a year Mm. um and that felt so cool Mm, I was like wow like I really got to think about what all these things mean and like wait why do I even need to prove my identity and to Mm, what mm, and mm. so that was a really amazing two years of just questioning everything and really, um, yeah, just doing doing life in a way that really filled me up and filled my cup. And before that, you know, I, uh, I think like most teenagers, I grew up in the party scene and I was living a very self-destructive life. I had no self-worth really making decisions that weren't good for my soul. Um, and I think that comes down to the environment cultural Mm, environment mm -hmm. and so that was a really incredible journey that really led me into like yeah land-based living and bushcraft and it started with kind of bushcraft and bush foods wild Mm, wild foods mm, mm -hmm. I was meeting people and I was like oh duh of course let's just eat this fruit (laughs) from straight from the tree (laughs) like that's the most natural thing we could ever do um And then, yeah, that kind of really led me into really wanting to get into deep into the ancestral skills. So the friction fire um, and the weaving and just living, living like that. I ended up um, in 2020, actually, when I did your Rewilding 101 course, I was living in um, my aunt's property, which is like surrounded by thousands of acres of national park and I was living in my bell tent there and so I spent four seasons in that bell tent and that was really um that was the grounded part Mm. of my rewilding journey it really rooted me into that Mm. ecology and the relationships that I was building from being in one place for Mm -hmm. that long that was really I feel like that was a really practical element so traveling Australia was like this kind of opening internally of like wow we can do things differently but then living there was like this yeah grounded manifestation of all of those values which is really incredible and then there you go i was just gonna say it's interesting like the the sort of dichotomy of the like nomadic life versus the like staying in one place uh Mm. and seeing a change over the seasons and how i don't know there's this there's something kind of rich in that uh, to me there's like the, you know the immediate return hunter gatherer life way of mostly seasonal migration but then also there's something to be said about being in a place and seeing it transform through the seasons and, mm. and getting to know it really well and i just it's just interesting to me because i i tend to I, I feel like there's some sort of um uh split oftentimes that people have where they're thinking you have either ha- are sedentary or nomadic or something along those lines mm. in terms of um, but it's it's cool to see how those sort of different um, levels of connection and uh, have different things to offer and different things to teach. And um, totally anyway. And, and I think and then that's been a really massive theme of my life over the last couple of years because I feel like we're all nomadic um, at heart, you know. So being in one place, I struggle with that um, at times, but it's actually gifted me mm-hmm. with so much connection and so much, you know, that being in one place, being able to tend to the garden and I don't know the patterns of the birds and the seasons. And that's a really special relationship to build on. So I feel like it is kind of just about doing both of them mm-hmm. at different times, totally. at different yeah. times of your life, because they yeah. both gift you with beautiful things. Mm-hmm. Mm. yeah so then after that I spent after 2020 I spent about six months um living in a completely off-grid like no electricity no running water property out in the middle of nowhere um and we were 
looking after some goats and I was a goat <laughs> mum for those nice. six months yeah. and that was a really incredible experience and that's really where I kind of deepened into traditional tanning and yeah so since then I think tanning has been one of my focus skills but along all of with all of them but I'm just so oh, amazed at the, our ancestral relationship with tanning hides and mm. it's interesting here in Australia because um, you know, with the Australian Indigenous mob, they had possum cloaks, right? But there's no, I've, I've gone through so many books and there's no evidence of any fat tanning. Mm. Um, there's there's potential um, bark, or not bark tanning, but tannin tanning with eucalyptus leaves. Mm. Um, but there's really, it's, it's, there's not a lot that I've found of, of evidence of that. So a lot of the information that I'm, learning about natural tanning is from like the European and American traditions, but that's been a really incredible journey. Yeah. That's awesome. It's cool mm. seeing, I mean, I, I feel like on Instagram or something, I see a lot of different people around the world all embracing these interesting different tanning techniques. And it's cool to see like, um, you know, I think it's, there's a, I think she's finished the bark tan, the salmon skin tanning woman, mm, mm. um, who has a book out and, you know, a lot of people L are like Lottie or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's cool to kind of see, you know, cause when I first got into ancestral skills, like 20 years ago, bark tanning wasn't a thing. Wow. <laughs> Fish skin tanning wow. wasn't really a thing, you know? Um, and now it's mm. like huge. It's, and it's in part, I think because of this like international information sharing, uh, that's not just reviving traditions, you know, in certain places, but bringing new methods to places to do things, mm. not necessarily the way people did, but in a way more connected to place. So I, I think it's totally. it is fascinating what observing that, because again, um, yeah, out of the few amount of books that I've read on natural tanning, and, and how we are, where we are now with it. It's like it's so much more scientific mm -hmm. now and people mm -hmm. are doing all these experimentations and things, which is so interesting to observe that. And that's really how you learn it. Like here, mm -hmm. it's just experimenting with different totally. barks yeah. and word of mouth and just mm -hmm. seeing what, what worked, which mm -hmm. is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you were um, herding goats, is that what it was or sheep? Goats. <laughs> goats, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. What was they that? They kind of heard it. They kind of okay. heard it themselves. They were pretty, <laughs> yeah. They was were it like wild. a goat farm, or was it just sort of like um, ranging? Or it, it was a it was a friend's property, and he was like a goat goat guy, goat herder, and um, really, they it was surrounded by a national park, and they kind of had their own trails, and they did their own thing, and they would come back each day um, if they wanted to, um, and we were m milking some of them and the intention was when we we actually um bottle raised some of the kids the intention mm. was for him to eventually um pack pack goat mm. with them mm -hmm. like on the trail mm -hmm. um but that was many many seasons ago so I'm not sure where that's all mm. <laughs> eventually mm -hmm. to now but it was just really cool another um another lens of life that I had no exposure to until that time. So I was like, wow, this is just yet another mm -hmm. option of living, you know, with the animals in the land. And yeah, there wasn't from what I observed, there wasn't um much destruction with the goats because obviously they're not native to here in Australia, but there was so many different types of plants and we, like enough for them mm. to have some and for the rainforest to still be okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was really cool to observe that. And now meeting people who are using goats as um, like bush regenerators mm -hmm. and that has been really amazing as well to see how we can use these beautiful, beautiful um, animals that aren't from here but we've brought them here so let's <laughs> work with it you know mm -hmm. mm. yeah that's awesome yeah yeah um so <clears throat> um how has your understanding of rewilding changed since you first got into it like with wild foods and and going through different iterations mm. i feel like at the beginning um I guess because my knowledge was so little at the beginning, 
um, everything was, it was kind of very idyllic, my relationship mm. with it. It was like, oh, my gosh, yes, we can just go out into the bush um, <laughs> and run away from mm -hmm. this place. Mm -hmm. And, look, I've still got that. That's still mm -hmm. lingering there. Like, mm -hmm. that's still deep in me, that that fantasy of really just, I think it's natural for humans totally. to really have that. Yeah. Um, but as I began to educate myself more and learn more, yeah, I really, it's really kind of turned into this, um, yeah, it's like a kind of way of living now or a lens that I look at, not just wild foods or not just the ancestral skills, but like social settings mm. and, and community community um, health and, mm. and, you know, all of these rewilding has just kind of opened up into this multifaceted um, lens that, that can be found anywhere, you know, and I've come to realise that you can meet someone who's living out in a rural area and someone that's living in the city, but there's someone in the city might be more practising more rewilding mm. skills and that mm. person in the remote area and that I was not like that at the start. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really great mm. um grounding journey of really unpicking rewilding and the ins and outs <laughs> of what it can look like because I was kind of fixated on, no, it's about the decisions we make and the food we eat and mm. the clothes we mm. wear, growing your hair out, like the whole um, identity of, of the what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, now I'm realising that, wow, it's so, so vast and it's such a big spectrum mm. as well. And that's been really cool to learn about different, yeah, different areas of rewilding and different places in society. Awesome. Mm. So you, did you start Wild Beings? And Yeah. Awesome. And so what was the inspiration to start that organization? So what do you do? So it was really cool, you know, after I did your Rewilding 101 um, course in 2020, I feel like that was just such an amazing kind of, um, it kind of propelled me into like, oh, wow, like there's people doing this and and creating spaces with this theme in the as the core all over the world. So let's do that here. And because I was I was in it because I was living out on the land at my aunt's property and I was like, I need to share this with mm. other humans. Like this just needs to be this way of living and these um yeah this this mentality and belief systems they need to be shared and accessible to the community um on the central coast, which is a pretty it's between like Sydney and Newcastle, so it's a pretty highly populated <laughs> area. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I had no idea. You know, I've been walking around barefoot for the last five years with the. I had no idea about business or nonprofit organisations or anything. So I was just chatting with <laughs> certain people, mm. like, "What is this language? I am not familiar with it." And I'm still like, it's so complex. Mm -hmm. I'm still not mm -hmm. really familiar mm -hmm. with it but I ended up um being set on starting up a foundation which is like a non-profit organization and so yeah went and did that and then I was like cool let's start running gatherings let's start getting people into this and it was received really well um I feel like I had a really a bit of a head start because I was already pretty established in my community from doing activism work mm, and mm, in mm -hmm. that kind of bushcraft world and so I already had like really good relationships with lots of families and so yeah it's kind of it's really grown since 2020 um we started with the intention to just bring people onto land in a camping um environment teaching them ancestral skills and in that kind of village vibe around the fire you know you don't even have to do much because the environment <laughs> does it. It's right, selfish. exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and then in the last year, that's kind of led into more um, like the public or private education system, which, again, I was like, oh, my gosh, like we have to, <laughs> we have to buy fancy shoes and we're going into this high school now that have, they all have lots of money. And I kind of did have a bit of resistance at the start to doing that, but I realised, mm -hmm. no, that's just my silly purest pride mm. I was like no this is important to be to reach those corners and it's important totally. for the grounded skills um 
to kind of infuse into into schools and mm-hmm. the education system. Mm-hmm. So that's been really amazing journey and yeah teaching these skills in that setting and it it pays well as well which is always a bonus when you're trying to make a living off totally off your passion yeah yeah Uh, yeah I had a similar thing you know uh, as a high school dropout I was like I'm never gonna teach in a school I'm never gonna (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then at some point you realize like man you know those children are essentially like captives you know they're they're in a box all day inside we can offer them a glimpse of something better, you know, and maybe that would yeah. inspire them to follow their hearts out, out of that box right. <laughs> or right. something after, you know, yeah. um, it might be a, it might be a little light that keeps them alive longer, you know? Mm. Um, totally, totally. Yeah. And that's been really rewarding. Like there's always the cool, cool kids that are like, Ugh, we don't want to get our night he's dirty or whatever but then there's the beautiful ones that are so we get um young women taking like notes with some of the stuff and we're like wow they're so Mm. into it and it's those ones that you kind of it really makes it all worth it Mm -hmm. it's like wow Mm -hmm. like they're gonna stare up with their little sisters and asking how to make cordage so they can make one for their siblings Mm -hmm. and that's just so rich that Mm -hmm. that kind of work it's really lovely that's awesome so Mm. Um, are you doing, you're also doing like ancestral skills gatherings, like bigger gatherings. Mm-hmm. Um, what has that been like? And and you said that you're seeing more people interested since you've started. Uh, I read an article recently in the BBC that was like, you know, bushcraft skills are, you know, in, gaining in more and more popularity. And another one in like the Guardian that was like, you know, survival skills in the US are increasing. People mm-hmm. are more interested. So I feel like there's a um, you know, a, a catalyst for interest in this stuff and then more people starting organizations like you. Um, how has that been, you know, to see the sort of growth of it? Are you able to mm. like do, is this your full-time thing now? You know, what's the, um, and what's your sort of long-term plan for it? Mm, yeah, great questions. Um, I feel like in a, in a sense, because it's, it's, I've only been in this kind of area for the last five years, so I feel like I am like an adolescent in <laughs> the in the broader rewilding community, you know, because there's been like people like you and um, some other folks in Australia that have been doing stuff for, you know, a decade at least. But it is, it's all happening right now within the bushcraft and the rewilding community. It's like, so I think alone the tv Mm -hmm. series has actually been a big part of exposing more common folk to um you know wilderness living skills and that has actually been yeah really incredible to witness and what i'm trying to get hold of is bringing relationship and connection to the survival skills Mm -hmm. you know that that and that's gonna you know we have different audiences people that want to learn survival skills maybe they don't care about the connection that's okay but we are practicing the skills rooted with that relationship and that connection for me and us who co-run it with me that's like the core of of it all it's the Mm -hmm. core of rewilding if you're just Mm -hmm. isolating the skills what's the point you're not actually rewilding then it's not an embodied building relationship Mm -hmm. and so that's been a really fun kind of, um, yeah, core value to to work with. And every everyone that comes really is deeply moved. It's not like, yeah, there's the, wow, we have this new practical skill now, but it's a deeper, you can see a deeper connection is being built from the people that are coming and spending time with other people out, out in the bush, um, learning new skills and there's something I feel like for whatever reason, maybe the world has always been hungry for more connection, but I feel like right now the world is so hungry mm-hmm. for connection. And just for me, it's about connecting to something way deeper than what we know in this modern context bubble. You know, it's about connecting to our origins, our mm-hmm. our that innate primal um, aspect of ourselves as a human being that is really important right now and I think that a lot of people that's why a lot of people are like yeah I really feel it they can't quite put Mm -hmm. words to it but it's this feeling of like wow 
I want to connect with this. Um, yeah, so that's been a really beautiful um, flame to, to tend to and the connections that we've had. It's a lot of families, you know. It's mostly families and, like, women from the ages of, like, 25 to 45, which mm. is really, mm -hmm. really cool. It's like the mums. Mm -hmm. The mums mm -hmm. are the, the true rewilding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and and it's interesting thinking about that. You know, I don't know if you watched um, the most recent season of Alone here in North America, but the first woman, Wonia, won, mm. um, you know, the first woman to win just won in this last season that they did a special, wow. like, um, you know, they brought people back. But there's also, it sounds like there's one in, happening in Australia right now also. I didn't yes. realize. I thought Alone was like a global show because they've been to Siberia a couple times or whatever, you know, yeah. but it, but it sounds like they're they're doing one specifically for Australia. Is it is it called Alone? Like, what is the premise? So it is. It's apparently Alone is like a brand now. So, and they have brought that brand to Australia, um, and it's we're up to episode four, which we just watched last night. And um, yeah, it's all the same. It's the same mm -hmm. vibe. The same everything as the American ones it's just totally so different because of the you know Aussie cultural element mm, of the mm. humans on it and their environment is so it's down in um the west coast of Tassie Tasmania mm. and it's like yeah incredibly um difficult terrain let's just yeah. say that's super wet all the time mm. um and I feel like I was like, I was questioning how are they going to hunt because they're not allowed bow hunting um, mm. down there and there's lots of laws because that's like a really protected totally. area down there. Yeah. Um, but they must have had a lot of money and a lot of discussions <laughs> with talking to the environmental protection people and so they're allowed to trap, um, I think, live traps and... Yeah, but I'm still curious because there's not live much traps. Games. So then, do they mm. do they dispatch them? They have to dispatch of them. Yeah, like with a club on it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to watch it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I what wonder that... where I'll I'll look up. I'll find links so I can put them in the notes for for viewers to find yes. out how you can watch. Because I know sometimes, you know, there's like a show in the UK that I've never been able to watch, that is a you know a survival type show where they. It was like eight people living as close as they could the, to hunting. the stone, the stone one. Totally, yeah. yeah it was like I've Stone tried. Age something or something. Yeah, I had yeah. a hard time finding access to that in the states. And there's also like Ray Mears, like none of Ray Mears uh, bushcraft television shows that are in the UK are available in the states either. So, oh my gosh. Anyway, um, those are my favorite. The Ray Mears, I think he's, I think his bushcraft stuff is is. I know, need to best, watch it. But... That's the, that, another silly thing. Like there's so many different channels and totally. different like networks. It's like, yeah. oh, um, on, on that, before we move on off that topic, one of our friends, Gina, is actually a contestant on the Australian one. And it's really great to see how she's like a rewilding facilitator as well. So she's, br again, bringing that mm. more rewilding mm. connected awesome. essence to like a survivalist mm -hmm. show. And mm -hmm. it's really great how well it, it's received as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure that there's really people out there that are like, well, they're not even skilled or a rabbit. <laughs> what I've observed is like everyone's receiving that really well. It's like mm -hmm. this beautiful connected approach. Like when Nia, when she, mm -hmm. it, oh, it was just so beautiful watching her and Callie Russell and their beautiful mm -hmm ancient approach to mm -hmm. the relationships on the land totally yeah mm. awesome um yeah so another question i have for you is what are the challenges in rewilding that are uniquely australian that like me being on the other side of the world might not be aware of at all or mm. anybody you know yeah, I was really pondering on this one because the initial answers that came to my mind, like, you know, some of the sensitivity around cultural appropriation um, and the laws and legislations in mm, Australia. Mm. Um, but I think that that, I assume that's glo like they're global issues. But I feel like mm, because, you know, we're such a young, we're such a young um, state over here. It's only been 250 years since 
colonization and so that yeah, it creates a really raw sensitivity around white people practising, you know, um, traditional earth skills. And that has been, it's actually been a really important journey for me. Um, I've, we've got we've got slammed before by Indigenous people and I really, yeah, I, it was really a learning curve for me because I was like, wow, like it's important for me I can't grasp it because I'm not them, but it's important for me and us um, to really, yeah, have reverence and have patience and understanding for the sensitivity of, yeah, that trigger of a white person doing fire by friction. And so that's been a really, yeah, a really beautiful journey. You know, we have really good relationships with mob around this area. What's um, mob? Mob, sorry, mob, mob is what we call like the mob, like yeah, Aboriginal folks. Yeah, that's just what we what we. Is it M O P or M O B? M O B. Have you mob. ever heard it ever? I've never heard that. No. Really? Yeah. Oh, no. Wow. Here, a mob, a mob is like a bad thing. A mob is like a group of people that are gonna, you know, burn your house down or. Oh no! <laughs> well, yeah. Let's clarify that. Over here. It's it's just what. Yeah, that's what interesting. We, what, huh. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, I I've never I've whenever I use the word because I've picked up that word from hanging around other Indigenous folks. It's never been a bad term. So mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. it's not. But it's never been. <laughs> yeah. Never been an insulting term yeah. used over here. Yeah. 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 I know that over here we have a term that a lot of people in the ancestral skills community use uh, that is the most racist thing you can say to an, a person, an uh, indigenous person in Australia, um, the A word. Wow. Um, but it's, you know, they, it, people over here use it as if it was just, uh, you know, um, a normal thing. It was basically, you know, the, the seven in the 1970s, these archaeologists started using the word Aboriginal and then they shortened okay. it. <laughs> oh and, yeah, yeah, and the shortened yeah, yeah, version yeah. of that yeah, is yeah, yeah. the racist thing in Australia, right? But they yeah. still use yeah. it, um, and they still use it here in a lot of places. But you know, it doesn't really matter if it's this hyper local thing. But once the internet right. was introduced, and these oh. people started using it on the internet, then it becomes a bigger problem, right? Where there's this, totally. there's a language challenge. Anyway, it's just interesting the different words that it is so interesting have carried. different meanings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. But yeah, it's been, you know, I think it's just really important for anyone who is wanting to practice and then teach, you know, these earth skills. You have to have relationship with local mm -hmm. Aboriginal folks. You just, mm -hmm. it's part of it. That's part of the rewilding journey. It's part of the healing as well. Um, and we're just really lucky that we have some great relationships back on Garinga and Dark and Young country, which is where um we're between um and it's so difficult because because it's so fresh the east coast really got uh, the east coast got really brutally hammered um by colonization and so that the the shadow of that is still rippling out there's a lot there's a lot of um disconnection even between local indigenous mobs with each other and trying like arguing about different names and different language and that's also still a big um alive thing so it's really important just to be educated and respectful and learn <laughs> just mm -hmm. learn and listen and yeah yeah that's but I assume that is that's a global global thing as well um how did yeah. you end up making connections with uh, Aboriginal folks and what 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 do you feel um, made that relationship like feel good? <laughs> mm, mm. I think oh how we began it was really just being in the places like doing activism things and and doing the work that we do. It's kind of you you can't avoid connecting with local Indigenous people because. Um, you just be at the same place or some of them I actually would seek them out and see if they're, you know, open to building a relationship. And, but that 
that's really happened quite naturally. Um, some of them have just been random <laughs> meeting mm. someone that mm-hmm. I didn't even know was was the Aboriginal person, and then all of a sudden find out, and I'm like, oh, cool! Like, and that they're doing a lot of a lot of their own cultural um, teachings around um, on Garingai country, which is the Central Coast, and yeah, I feel um, you just have to be real. You have to be real and honest. And I feel like if you're real and honest, then that's the best way to actually mm-hmm. create a strong relationship. Because yeah, I it's it it doesn't surprise me that there is pr- probably trust issues there with you know white people going out right. into community like trying to be like I don't know trying to have good intentions but actually not not being completely themselves Mm -hmm. and I feel like um indigenous folks have a can pick up on that they can they can feel Mm -hmm. that and so really just being real and being yourself uh, has really been our my way and that's worked pretty well (laughs) awesome yeah yeah and there's you know on the east coast from where we are between like yeah, Sydney and Newcastle, that region, I feel like we're so disconnected from the um, the West, which is a whole different world. Like there is so much um, going on out there in terms of like, yeah, the government trying to take ownership of the Murray-Darling, like the amazing river that goes all the way from Queensland down through New South Wales. I think through Victoria and then South Australia and there's a lot of really terrible things that have been going on out there that on the East Coast we're kind of blinded unless we Mm. go out there and see it, um, which I've had the absolute privilege of being able to do a couple of times. And we went on a, um, it's called the Barker River, which is the Aboriginal word for it. And um, a couple of amazing Indigenous folks ran like an activism tour corroboree along that river a couple of years ago it was like 12 hours inland so it was amazing mm. and we we were welcomed to each new country by mob and dancing and oh it was so so special to be involved with that but it also was like oh my gosh Eva like living on the east coast we're in a bubble we have everything mm. we mm. need there's mm. water mm. whatever food we want the beach like happy blah 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 as soon as you go out there, it's like it's a struggle to get mm. because that was a drought. It's a struggle to get clean water mm. and the food. Mm. Like mm-hmm. it's like really terrible processed food, and mm. mm-hmm. it's so. It's, I think it's really important for um, Australians who are you know wanting to connect with the land to actually go and expose themselves to to those communities and to see the reality of what it's still like in a lot of Australia. We're mm. so. We're so privileged on the East Coast and it's, I think, really important and humbling to, yeah, go go and be of service in whatever way possible out in these areas, which I'm sure it's the same in, in yeah. America. Yeah, definitely. Different geographies, but essentially the same kinds of situations totally. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, one of my questions was, you know, what does decolonial rewilding look like in Australia? But I think you basically answered it already. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, all the stuff yeah. that, we're, that we're talking about. So um, totally. it looks similar and different. Um, totally. Is there, uh, you know, here in the States, there's a, a huge and a growing problem of white supremacists, like, you know, essentially mm-hmm. neo-Nazis. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm curious, you know, we, you know, we have like Antifa and other organizations that, or Antifa is not really an organization, I guess it's more like just an idea. Um, but there are sort of like, you know, things that are preventing or trying to, to resist the white supremacists that are actively trying to um, disrupt and also like infiltrate different scenes. And I'm wondering mm. if you experience any of that um, in your rewilding over there. Mm. Yeah, we look, wild beings itself hasn't really been too affected by that, but my observations of that is a different story. Mm. And it's kind of what our goal has been is is has been around just trying to bring it back to um bring it back to realness, bring it back to 
um, connection with the earth and there's no bells and whistles, there's no this and that. It's not for personal gain. It's about creating um, a movement that, yeah, that does reconnect and that does heal and that does um, have the fruits that it bears are actually regenerative. And and I feel like, yeah, there is a lot of um, folks out there that I guess are, yeah, not really getting getting the point of it all and using, you know, the terms mm-hmm. rewilding and things like that um, to dress up their, yeah, their own their own idea of what yeah i mean i guess that's sort of i guess there's infiltration i i I don't know if infiltration is the right word when it's not um you know like white supremacist groups but like there's definitely sort of co-option i guess too of Mm. like mainstream um i don't know if mainstreaming is really the thing but just co-option by i guess like people trying to make a buck right um yeah we've yeah we've seen that here in the states over the years you know different sort of um fake rewilding gurus or, you know, supplement, Mm. supplement, everything from supplement sales to, Mm. um, you know, exploiting people's desire for spiritual connection by teaching, you know, bullshit classes from people who have zero training or connection to any like long-term spiritual program or religion or anything like that. With no lineages behind yeah. them or anything, that's yeah. That's been, I guess, my experience with that kind of stuff was when I was kind of dabbling in some of the new agey mm-hmm. community, like years and years ago on on that big travel that I did, mm. and now, yeah, really just seeing the toxicity of of that kind of behavior and actually observing the toxic dynamics, like personal interrelationship mm. dynamics within that, I was like, whoa, man, this is really dangerous, like using that kind of false spiritual identity to create um, an identity for yourself that kind of, yeah, lures people towards you or something. And I feel like essentially that's like modern-day dark magic. <laughs> like it, it's yeah. Like really. Yeah, for real. Like, Mm-hmm. Like it, it is, there's, we all are wired to want to connect and, and, you know, want to believe in something and, and want to follow in a certain, not all of us, but some of us. And I feel like there's a lot of these practices that are really taking advantage of that, um, you know, basic psychology of the human mind. And so that's definitely important to be aware of and something to kind of just avoid. And at our gatherings really, because it's so down to earth, like myself, my partner, Will and Clay, um, who are the, like the co-runners as well, co-founders, we all are so kind of, I guess, bushy. That's the only way, like, <laughs> we, we create, we create. Did you um, say bushy? Like, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the best word that I could think of. <laughs> We and we really create it's so there's no room for those kind of slippery energies to come through. And sometimes, you know, we've had to tighten the boundaries a little bit because there are, um, yeah, loose ends that want to come in and to either take advantage of like volunteering but actually not being of service and then bringing mm. kind of weird, um, spiritual belief systems that aren't actually aligned with. <laughs> what we're doing and so that's all being good for us to observe that and be like okay how can we tighten that so that next time there's no room for that Mm -hmm. to even penetrate Mm -hmm. through yeah um and what does that doing it what does that look like what is like tightening a boundary do you have like an example um let me just think back let me scan my brain so the last ancestral skills gathering, yeah, we've done we've done I think about four or five now, and there's only really been one where we had um, an issue with just a lot of a, a really broad mix of um, energies that were <laughs> coming from like the um, you know rainbow rainbow tribe kind of you know that you know that kind of vibe and. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how else to word it. Yeah. Um, but 
that like it's our our gatherings are strictly like no substances and no mm. and if mm. you if you smoke cigarettes that's fine just go do it when in your own little mm-hmm. area not not around anyone but it's no substances like no alcohol no nothing like that and we also have a culture around healthy food you know like that because that's all part of it and um when there was a few um little slip ups of that happening last time i i'm the one who usually just says i use my words just gently and just pull that person aside and just say this isn't really appropriate but we spoke about it myself and will and clay we spoke about it for the next one that we really need to set those intentions at the beginning opening fire circle Mm -hmm. we've never had to before Mm -hmm. because it's always just been fine but i think now because there's going to be more um yeah more diverse personalities coming in it's important to set those values speak them out loud Mm -hmm. so that everyone can then look after that and yeah that's that's been a big a good lesson for us Mm -hmm. and really I feel like a lot of it is practical, but it's also energetic as well, yeah. like the boundary thing. It's really energetic. And so making sure that myself and Will and Clay are all on the same level and holding that and communicating throughout mm. the gatherings. And But honestly, we have been so lucky, Peter. It's been really, really solid and great because the humans that have been attracted have been anchored in that um you know frequency of wanting to connect to the land it's only one or two that's been a bit Mm -hmm. whoa Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but that was good learning curves Mm -hmm. for us as Mm -hmm. facilitators as well because that's been a whole other journey we were not facilitators we were just a group of friends who were loving this lifestyle and seeing the value and then all of a sudden now in the last three years we're facilitators and learning the ins and outs of that um so that's been a whole other Mm-hmm. journey i was thinking about it the other day and i feel like at the beginning of the of wild beings when we began we were kind of in the adolescent phase of rewilding and now it's like moving more into the mm-hmm. adult mm-hmm. phase of rewilding um which Giving feels back. good yeah yeah for sure mm-hmm. for sure it feels really good yeah it's so fun to hear other facilitators uh, experiences and going through this process. It's like, you know, both like it's always inspiring and also validating, (laughs) Mm, you know, like mm. sometimes, you know, at most of our gatherings, we'd say, you know, no substances, but there's a few where it's kind of like a gray area. And this one year, um, you know, it's weird, the kind of boundaries that you have to set up as like a, a legal entity too, you know, it's not yes, like yeah, you can just totally. do the same thing and like inviting your friends over or whatever, right now you're liable. Totally. And so it just, the stakes totally. are higher and it, on yeah. some level it, it creates new challenges that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't like to have, for instance, um, yeah. you know, one of our gatherings echoes in time, uh, these parents called me and the year we sort of took it over from the previous facilitator. And they were like, um, you know, our daughter, we want to drop her off and just let her be there for the week. She's like 16, you know, we want it to be like a rite of passage. And I was like, hell yeah, that's awesome. Like I was 16 and I would have loved to have my parents just drop me off at echoes in time. You know, I would have been like a kid in a candy shop. Um, but this particular teen wasn't really like her parents were kind of putting her into the situation. It's not like she wanted to be there per se. Yeah. Yeah. And she ended up like going around and stealing stuff from all these different wow. teachers. And yeah. then, um, you know, one of the teachers confronted her and made her give all the stuff back eventually. And, um, after that we were like, okay, no more like teens that don't yeah. have parents with them or whatever, like my, yeah. you know, it's a liability, Um, you know, these different things. And it's, it's lame because as somebody who would have loved that opportunity, I I know that we're actually having to then deny that opportunity to somebody who might want it, but just for the legal reasons, you know, and it's just weird stuff like that, that kind of, you know, comes up. And then when you were talking about substances, it it just reminded me, there was like another time where a teen came with a group of people that were there, but without their parents. And so they were kind of just like doing whatever, and I was I thinking that these these group of people that that a parents that they came with were going to basically be acting like their parents, but they didn't. 
And this teenager was like, you know, another, another kid narked on them for, you know, getting high or whatever. And so like, wow. I had to like sit this teenager down and be like, all right, yo, like, here's the, you know, like, yeah, I don't give yeah. a shit what you do on your own time, but don't fuck with this gathering. Cause you could yes. ruin it for everybody, you know? Totally. Um, and mean, he was very like, I'm so sorry. You're totally right. I get it. I fucked up, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Um, and it was fine. But from then on, it was just like, you know, we have to be actually pretty diligent about that, that boundary. For like, sure. Yeah. For sure. And you know, that's the thing you are, when you're facilitating something, you're essentially responsible for everyone's experience exactly. there. So you have to exactly. take that seriously. And as much yeah. as our type of personality, we want to kind of help everyone and, and help the, you know, the younger, more troubled teens and stuff. Mm -hmm. Actually, I feel like that that's a whole separate thing in itself. Totally. Like there's yes. a time and a place for that because exactly. you want the people that are coming to really get the most out of that experience. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing mm -hmm. to learn, isn't it? But it can be difficult <laughs> yeah. at times. <laughs> yeah. And all, and like you said, you're, everyone's experience, the kind of weight of that is on your shoulders as the facilitator. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think sure. most people sure. don't know that. Most people don't realize like sure. just how much uh emotional weight i think facilitators often carry you know oh, yeah you know. for sure <laughs> and that, and i didn't until i had no idea until starting to do it and even as well it's made me really respect like if i'm going to go to someone else's workshop or something um I will, I'm happy to pay them that full totally. price. Like I want to yeah. support them. And that's been <laughs> yeah. an interesting thing mm -hmm. with volunteers, like mm -hmm. wanting to just come for free while I'm running. Like, hang on, of course we want everyone to just live like this. But right now do, we've done food, accommodation and our time. Mm -hmm. And it's like a lot of people don't actually get that at totally. all. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so part of it. Well, I'm excited to great. continue. Well, go ahead. Sorry, I, th I was just going to say it would be great if we could create like a self-organizing village where there was the, the more, you know, troubled teens and that there were people that could look after that. Like that would be amazing, but not quite there yet. Totally. <laughs> we're just on the yeah. stepping stone. Yeah. And I mean, maybe that becomes a that's another group's um, role and you can always yeah. send people to that group, that organization. Right. Like there's yeah, there's plenty of organizations that do awesome stuff. And yeah. Well, I think, you know, to sort of identify what it is that you're doing and what everybody else is doing to be able to send people to where they're going to receive the most benefit. You for know? sure. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm excited to continue watching, um, you know, your organization grow. And I, at some point, will make it, uh, you know, it's on my bucket list <laughs> to come yes, to Australia. So, come over. Um, that would be awesome. Yeah, I would love to come out there and check it out sometime. Oh, we would love to have you here. It would be amazing. <laughs> and, you know, just on that note, there is, it's really, um, it's really rare in Australia for like the ancestral living skills teachers. Like there's only a handful that I know, there's probably a lot more out there that, that know those skills and then are mm. less than that are teaching it. Mm. And then I look in America and Europe and all these amazing wilderness living schools. I'm like, oh. Oh my goodness, like I hope that that well that's the intention that that's the future of Australia, mm -hmm. you know, like that's mm -hmm. that's definitely our vision mm -hmm. and our future is to really create that movement uh, much more wider um in Australia. Awesome. Yeah, so we would love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um yeah, so did you have any questions for me? Oh, I did. Um one of them that I remember, I'm trying to remember. Oh, I can look them up right here. Let me see. I know one of them was about um, AI. I'm just so <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll read it. The modern world is quickly becoming infiltrated with AI. What are your thoughts on this? How do you feel about AI benefits and dangers? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question in terms of like, <laughs> how does AI affect rewilding? I, For sure. I have not, <laughs> honestly, I don't even know the abbreviation. There's some... AI chat thing now. I know that I should probably look it up. I'm actually scared to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. keep seeing these pictures, you know, um, that AI's generated and they keep getting better in the video. And, you know, I'm on, I use social media to some degree. So I see AI generated stuff yeah. quite a bit now. Um, yeah. And I, there's a few people who I follow that are in the tech world 
And, um, you know, I mean, it, it sounds like right now, AI, it's not actually AI. That's the one thing that people don't understand is it's not AI. It's an algorithm. Yeah. An algorithm is yes. not AI, right? Like AI is a sentient. Once it is artificial intelligence, it's actually like self-aware, right? Where yeah. the algorithms yeah. are technically Ugh. not self-aware. So yeah. it's not it's real AI, right? Yeah. It's just code. So yeah. at this point, um, you know, it, it, it's still just going to be used, utilized as a tool. The problem is um, the state, right? How is it? I don't, you know, how is the state going to use AI to continue mm. to distribute wealth unequally between its subjects, right? That's, mm. and, and to compete with other states. So mm. that to me is the scarier part is like, what That's are the cool. elements that we're, that we don't know? That AI is being used to um, basically create, you know, the way to continue the class war <laughs> for the yeah. elite, um, you know, because I yeah. don't see AI in, in the sense that every technology that gets invented, you know, anarchists or whoever is inventing it is like, you know, the Internet's going to free the world, like freedom of information, right? Mm, like mm, the mm. oil economy is going to make it so that we don't, you know, robots are going to make it so that humans don't have to work anymore. But that's not mm. how the economy works. So even though there's robots, there's more poor people and more rich people, right? And so it's just that it's the same with AI, you know, mm -hmm. um, AI is just a new technology or, or, or what they call AI, these, um, you know, these al super intelligent algorithms that can create things and dream or whatever. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely um, be yeah. freaky. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking creepy as hell. Yeah. Um, I, I just like every day, I'm just like, I hope that all of this just you know, goes away before, before anything, you know, before yeah. another, like a nuclear level, nuclear mm. bomb level technology is invented. You know, it's like when they, when they blew up the first nuclear bomb, they were like, yeah, there's a chance this might like explode the atmosphere and kill every living thing on the planet. And they oh, fucking yeah. did it anyway. Yeah. You totally. know, and I just think totally. that, that, that mindset is what's driving all of this stuff. Uh, you know, even yeah. like nanobots, right? Like self-replicating yeah. nanobots could consume yeah the world in like eight hours or something, you know, like, it's really can, weird. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's fucking so contrasting, weird. isn't it? Yeah, it's so yeah, contrasting it, to everything yes. we know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so there's some level of like, it, it's so, it's all like a meteor hitting the earth. I, there's no way to predict what's beyond the, the so-called event horizon or the, um, mm -hmm. what's it called? The, uh, singularity, right? Like there's yeah. no way to yeah. know what's beyond that or if we'll even hit it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure based on the the mathematics of the collapse of complex societies by Joseph Tainter, uh, that we'll never, we'll never hit an event horizon that doesn't just mm. um, knock civilization out if it does anything mm. at all. But there, there yeah. is technology that could kill every living thing on the planet. That For exists. sure. And that to For me sure. is just like the freakiest fucking thing. Mind boggling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, life finds a way. You know? Yeah, that's so, true. So life sure will go on. It might not. Up. It might not have people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Your second question was what element of rewilding is most important from your perspective, the inner decolonizing work or the lifestyle choices, for example, learning practical skills that connect you with the land. Um, let me think about that. Yeah, I think this is a question that's just constantly, it's like a roulette wheel in my head of like, what's the most important thing of rewilding? And in general, yeah. changes to like whatever it is that I'm doing at any given yes. moment. Yeah. Um, I, can I just say something? Mm -hmm. I listened yeah. to, I was listening to your rewilding um, podcast. I think it is Everyday Rewilding. Mm. And I kind of love how, yeah, you were saying that it is, it's changing every single day and it's depending on, yeah, what you're doing and the environment that you're in and what you want to achieve that day. Like, I feel like when I wrote that question, I listened to the podcast after mm, it mm. and I was like, okay, that makes sense. It's not, they're not isolated things. It's this holistic approach and it kind of, yeah, made more sense then, but still, still curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love answering things and, and trying to figure out different ways of saying things too, but it, I mean, you know, like you were saying earlier and like I, I've said before, it's like, you know, rewilding is a lens. So developing mm. that lens 
then allows you to do all these other things through the lens, right? So in terms of like, what is the most important, I think developing that lens or like yeah. you were saying, you know, the getting into the mindset, like decolonizing your mind. Um, and what that looks like oftentimes is just having conversations with people like this and learning yeah. things, like reading anthropology, sure. listening to history, like learning about, you know, what they're learning about human nature and not from like yes. pop cultural writers like Steven Pinker, who wants to project mm -hmm. this idea that humans are innately evil, um, you mm -hmm. know, or, and that the mm. state and civilization is like the best thing to happen to humanity. Mm. Um, or even like the David Graber's and Wengro's, you know, they're the dawn of everything book, you know, like they're, they're off mm. the mark too, because they're both of those people ignore massive amounts of anthropological evidence to get to their conclusions. If you were to yeah. read the majority of contemporary anthropology today and paleobiology and ethnobiology and these different things, you wouldn't come to those conclusions because you wouldn't be trying to omit all the things that those authors omit. Yeah. So I think like having that narrative, right, of what, what does rewilding look like? It means fully understanding humans are past mm. place in the ecosystem mm. and then with that knowledge trying to figure out how to move in a different direction that's more resilient right so and that could be anything um but i also think you know there's a level of um uh baiting people with carrots right <laughs> that's one of the things i yeah. think about with with kind of the work that we do right like there are people who get into rewilding the deeper aspects of it by coming in through different avenues and so, you know, my, one of my favorite things is, is bushcraft, survival, ancestral technology. Mm -hmm. I've always mm -hmm. loved that stuff. I think it's an intrinsic thing that most people love because it's just, you know, it makes us as people come alive in the, the, with the knowledge of, of craft and how to create things and the self-confidence and all that kind of stuff that it can do for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but in a sense, it's like a carrot to bring people in to then talk to them about yes. the meanings of humanity, yeah. right? Yeah. And so get them hooked. Yeah. And so I think that there's like, you know, what is, I, I think it's important as a mentor or as a um, educator or facilitator, it's important to like understand the different hooks, you know, that, that bring people in so that yes. then as once we have their attention, their captivated attention, we can start to transmit more of these narratives. You know, like I teach a friction fire class, people show yeah. up to that. They're like, I'm going to learn how to rub sticks together. And I'm like, did you know that the earliest humans to start fire was probably Homo erectus. Oh, you don't know what Homo erectus is? Let me tell you about yes. human prehistory. <laughs> you yes. know, and you get into like how long we've been, you know, using fire and how our digestive tracts changed and how our brain our size changed and like yes. how we're yeah. a fire adapted species. And then, you know, fire in the land and then tending the wild. And then, you know, you can yes. just start like, yes. you know, well, what happened to that? Why, why, are, why did we get to be with the way we are now? And so just yes. kind of using every little avenue to yeah. rope people in further and further down this, um, this path. I think that's to me, um, you know, but it, it can also be through, you know, um, gardening or, mm. you know, just like any of the things like paleo health, right? Like there's people that are interested in the paleo diet that are like, I'm interested in paleo nutrition. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Let me explain like, you know, mm, the different yeah. assets of, of nutrition and how that relates back to, you know, why we're not living a, in the, you know, adapted environment now. Like how did our environment get mismatched to begin with? And people yeah. then kind of go into those avenues, you know, or even political, you know, you can get into politics and activism when you're talking about different state governments and, you know, what did people do before there was a government and how did people manage, you know, what was it actually like? What is it like today among stateless societies? They're the most egalitarian societies mm. that we've ever seen, um, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So I feel like there's a way of connecting the narrative to any particular action that people do um, that is interrelated to rewilding. And then once they have that narrative, then they can be doing those actions through the narrative and bringing other people under that umbrella as well. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> But it makes no it makes perfect sense and I've really noticed that with over here as well like teaching the skills you're you're wanting to open up the rabbit hole the deep rabbit hole of that each of these skills come from and 
I think it's really about getting people to ask questions, to yeah. question this whole yeah. world that we've been born into. Ask questions. Like, and when people ask questions, then they kind of go on their own journey of discovering. But it's like wanting to mm-hmm. shake them out of that mm-hmm. comfortability totally. yeah. and, and realize that they do have to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Like, why am I living like this? Why am I breathing like this? Why am I wearing shoes? Mm-hmm. Like all those kind of things that lead you to deeper, mm-hmm. deeper avenues of our yeah. discovering our origins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody might just have thought they were going to come to learn a survival skill and now they're yeah. like deep in the rewilding milieu or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that that to me is sort of the key. Uh, and, and hopefully that, that is what continues to grow the rewilding movement is organizations doing stuff like yours. Yeah. So, um, yeah. For sure. Thank you so much for coming on the rewilding podcast. I think we're out of time. <laughs> Thanks um, for having me, Peter. I can't wait to great. catch up more and hear more about all the stuff that you do as time goes on. Yeah, me too. I'm excited for the future. Awesome. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Rewilding Podcast. Check out the show notes to connect with my guest and for a list of resources that we mentioned in our conversation. If this episode inspired you, made you think more deeply, or gave you some new tools to use, Make sure to subscribe and become a patron at patreon.com slash Peter Michael Bauer. And of course, if you're new to rewilding or want to expand your perception of it, I recommend attending one of my rewilding 101 workshops, which I offer both in person in Portland, Oregon, and online via Zoom for those who live around the world. You can check out upcoming dates and register at rewildportland.com. Thanks for listening.